There's not much to do in Walla Walla this time of year. For entertainment, we like to go out and watch the trains come in and out. Oh, watch out there. Did you know you can get the latest train schedules in the Garden City Gazette? This issue is February 2nd, 1895. Mrs. W. H. Harvey of Pullman, a daughter of the Honorable L. M. Ringer, was with her husband admitted to the bar by Judge Sullivan at Colfax last Tuesday. She underwent a rigid examination both by the judge and a committee of lawyers. She is the first female to be admitted to practice law in this state. The people of Walla Walla will be interested to know that Mrs. Harvey was Miss Lulu Ringer, a bright young lady who graduated from Whitman College a few years ago. Social Observations W. H. Winfield is in the city from California. Jacob Betts arrived this morning from Olympia. H. C. Willis of Blaylock, Oregon is with us to stay. Tabitha Giles and Harley Thornton of the Pataha Flats are spending a couple weeks in Walla Walla on Pleasure Bent. Henry Kelling, our popular city clerk and famous statistician, is confined to his residence with a throat complaint. The Reverend Dr. V. Marshall Law. The Spokesman Review has ventilated partly to the unsettled condition of affairs of St. Paul's Parish in this city. Dr. Law is the pivot between the two factions which condemn and uphold him. It is unfortunate that such should be the status of the church that has been so prominently in the town's history. There is no doubt that Dr. Law is mostly to blame for the uprising owning to his personality in the pulpit. While unjust things may have been said against him, it is generally thought that he has been out of place in dragging innocent people into his sermons. He should have remembered, too, that other people have feelings as well as himself. But as Dr. Law is gone, let the matter drop and the sore be healed in the best and quickest possible way. He scooped the papers. The remarkable ride of Frank Gruard, Chief of Government Scouts. The frequency in which road and racing records have been made and broken of late reminds the western stock breeder of a remarkable exploit once performed by Frank Gruard, Chief of Scouts. When 19 years of age, Frank was captured by Sitting Bull's band of hostile Indians and kept a prisoner with the savages for five years and nine months during which time he was forced to enter into all the customs. Being born on one of the islands in the South Pacific Ocean, he inherited the bronzed complexion so peculiar to people of tropical climates. Sitting Bull, contrary to the opposition of the head counselors of the Sioux Nation, adopted him as his brother gave him the name of Standing Bear, and protected him against the plots of the Sioux to murder him. In 1875, just at the breaking out of what was known to the frontier history as the Sioux War, Gerard made his escape from the Indians and found his way to the Red Cloud Agency, then situated about one mile from where Fort Robinson, Nebraska is now located. General George Crook, the most successful campaigner against the Indians, took Gerard into the government service 
and afterward, in speaking of him, said, I would sooner lose a third of my command than Frank Gerard. It was during his service with Crook as Chief of Scouts that Gerard made the phenomenal ride of 101 miles in 4 hours and 10 minutes. During the earliest part of the 1876 campaign, the newspaper correspondent had repeatedly beaten out or scooped the government on news. After the Battle of Slim Buttes, General Crook gave Gerard the official dispatches with instructions to get them to the nearest telegraph station ahead of any newspaper reporters, regardless of the expense. A command was camped on Willow Creek. In the morning, Gerard set out early for Deadwood, and on riding up to Livery Barn, was astonished to find the government mule in which the newspaper scout had been riding hitched there. Upon inquiry, he discovered that the newspaper scout had hired the best horse in the barn at Deadwood and hit the trail for Custer City, 101 miles distant. It was then 10.30 in the forenoon. Gerard jumped upon the fastest horse he could secure and started to overhaul the newspaper reporter. At the end of 25 miles, the first horse fell dead. Securing another, he started off again, and in making the remaining distance, changed animals six times, killing three of the horses. He overtook the other scout some distance from Custer City, reaching the latter place at 2.40 p.m., four hours and ten minutes from the time of starting. Gouard had to be lifted from the saddle and was unable to get out of bed for three days thereafter. The nearest telegraph station was Fort Laramie, and he secured couriers to take on the official dispatches at once and beat out the scout, who tried to outride him by three days. Few men could have made that ride under the most favorable circumstances, for it resolved itself into a feat of physical endurance. But the record of it is preserved in the government archives and is easily proved. The trip cost the government something over $500, but the news of the Battle of Slim Buttes was known all over the United States before the newspaper specials made their appearance, and the War Department officials were perfectly satisfied. Spring Valley Springings. John Ferris is still after that wheat. A. Murphy knows the path he helped to make. Fred Miller has been doing Walla Walla this week. Mrs. Wallace was visiting friends in the valley last week. Ed Miller has a sled that can outrun any team in his stables. Charles Ellis is looking for the would-be hunter who shot his bird dog. Blue Creek Pebbles. The pebbles that come to view in the sands of time as they flow through the Blue Creek Hourglass will be exhibited in the Gazette hereafter. Reverend Leekhorn and Mr. Warren are conducting revival services at the Mill Creek Schoolhouse. They are meeting with the reward of interest and several conversions. A number of the young folks of this community are sick, none serious. R. Griffith, the man who was kicked by a horse some time since, is improving. He attributes his rescue to Dr. Crop. Additions to the pen. The population of the penitentiary was increased Tuesday evening by the arrival of two convicts from Spokane. Thompson, one of the men brought in, was an escaped convict who was serving a two-year sentence from Spokane County. The other criminal brought in with Thompson is Jed Barber, who was sentenced to three years for cattle stealing. Had a bullet in his head. Colonel Sidney G. Cook, local manager of the Western Branch of the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers at Leavenworth, probably is the only man in the world who ever sneezed a bullet out of his head. 
Colonel Cook was badly wounded at the Battle of the Wilderness, a ball from a Confederate rifle having penetrated his brain. The night was very dark, and a lone Confederate named Charles N. Jones skulked about the field. He stumbled over Cook in the bushes, and a rifle still grasped in the apparently dead soldier's hand attracted his attention. He stooped to appropriate the weapon for himself when Cook groaned. Jones had a few drops of whiskey in his flask, which he forced into the wounded man's mouth, and he revived. He was a powerful fellow and succeeded in carrying Cook into his own camp, a prisoner. His wound was dressed and he improved rapidly, with the bullet remaining in his head. After about three weeks, he was sent to Andersonville. He became strong, that is, as strong as it was possible for a man to become at Andersonville. One day he commenced to sneeze, and he nearly sneezed himself to death. He sneezed for ten days. With the last sneeze came the bullet. It had been in his head nearly eight months. Colonel Cook carries the bullet as a war relic. Jones is now a prosperous lawyer in Greensboro, North Carolina, and he and Cook are very good friends, as they should be.